Good evening. This is VK3 EKH. VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Nary Warren South. <coughs> We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and broadcasting via the Melbourne television repeater in full HD which is also being broadcasted by the British Amateur Television Club video server. I also have a YouTube channel running which you can find by typing in VK3CSJ VK3Charlie Sierra Juliet in the YouTube search engine and just look for the live link. We also have a chat window a Discord chat window, so if you uh, install Discord, look for the uh, Astronomy Chat uh, uh, ASV uh, um, uh, Discord uh, link, something along those lines, and uh, you'll get there. Um, we also have a email address too for signal reports, which you can send to vk3ekh at gmail dot com vk3 ekh at gmail dot com tonight's going to be a bit of a lengthy session uh, I plan to broadcast the entire interview um, from uh, Brendan O'Brien's uh, Astrophys website with his interview with Greg Sleep and uh, I listened to it uh, last uh, week while pottering around on Saturday afternoon I think and uh, I found it uh, uh, a most interesting and educational interview. The quality is good. Uh, shouldn't be any problem there. Um, and uh, the uh, the calibre uh, of the interview is uh, is rather interesting. With the the sorts of thing that Greg uh, um, um, uh, how he got into uh, doing radio astronomy. It's uh, really is interesting his journey into that field. And uh, I feel I was going to split the interview up into two halves, but I felt that uh, uh, it's probably best to uh, to broadcast it in one fell swoop. It's probably one of the longest interviews Brendan's done on his astrophys.com website. There is a transcript transcript available if you go to astrophys.com and look for the latest episode, episode one seven five. You'll find an, an actual transcript transcript of the uh, interview there as well. Um, thanks to Brendan for allowing me to uh, to broadcast this. I will have to break up the broadcast uh, every 10 minutes or so just with a quick announcement. That's uh, unfortunately that's uh, license requirements that we do a, a bit of uh, announcements thing if I remember to do it but uh, every 10 odd minutes so I'll just uh, do a quick stop and announce what's going on or who it's coming from and all that sort of stuff. But before I do, um, I, I do have a, uh, a new updated uh, um, solar report from Tamitha Scove, our space weather woman. So I'm going to run that first so we can get that one out of the way as a bit of a, a warm up and intro. <laughs> and then we'll uh, segue into. Uh, um, astrophys.com's interview with Greg Sleep and uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll hang in there and be thoroughly uh, um, entertained, no, uh, educated. Um, a very pleasant good evening to everybody. I hope uh, everybody is fine and uh, doing well and trying to stay warm. I, I can't believe how cold this winter has been. On this 21st of July, it's around about this time that uh, Apollo 11 uh, was uh, upon the moon doing various things. So, uh, very interesting stuff. Um, a very pleasant good evening to Martin and the Cassio Pia and David, uh, resident uh, MBO uh, um, uh, uh, member. And uh, I haven't quite got the email going yet, but I'm sure there is some emails already popped in. Um, hang on, where's my mouse? I'll just uh, go up to uh, to the inbox if I can find my mouse. There it is. I've got two screens between one mouse. 
and uh, come on, just open. There we go. So uh, no, uh, no emails at this point. That's okay. All right, you're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Please stand by for our latest solar report from Timber. We have an Earth-directed solar storm that's going to sideswipe Earth, and some more flare activity is on the way. The stories are more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Our sun finally picks up in activity this week as we take a look at our Earth-facing disk. We do have a lot of regions in Earth view, but we'll get back to those in a minute. Meanwhile, take a look at this big coronal hole that's been rotating in through the Earth strike zone. It's been sending us a little bit of fast wind, but that's not all that much news. If you take a look just to the east of that, however, do you see that big long filament? We've been following this filament all the way across the Earth-facing disk. We were thinking it gave us a couple of false starts. We we're thinking it was going to launch, but but finally, on the 4th, watch it there, whoosh! Do you see that? It looks like it's going to go west of Earth mainly, but because we have the fast wind from this coronal hole that's just to the west of that, it may actually deflect this uh, solar storm into the path of Earth. So we could get a glancing blow sometime around the 7th. That's what the NASA models look like, but it's kind of hard to tell. We'll talk more about that later. Meanwhile, as we take a look at a couple of the regions in the south, we've got region 3323 and 3327. These are big flare players, and we are watching them right now to see whether or not they're going to start really ramping up activity. Meanwhile, that solar flux is going to ramp up, and we've got more regions on the sun's far side that have yet to rotate into view, so it looks like finally we're going to have some chances for aurora and possibly big flares. Switching to our M flare and radio blackout threat meter, as we take a look at the X-ray flux over the last week, we really haven't been getting that much activity. We have popped a couple big M-class flares back on June 1st and on June 2nd, but since then, things have pretty much quieted down. You might have noticed though, there's a lot less noise on the bands over the past few days, but this is not going to last. Radio blackouts are going to start coming back because we are having big flare players rotate back into Earth view and expect that noise floor to ramp up and the solar flux also to ramp up near the end of the week. So amateur radio operators, just get ready. On Earth's day side, it's going to be a bit more lively. Switching to our solar storm conditions, over the past week, things have been reasonably quiet. We've been hovering between unsettled conditions to even quiet conditions at times. We have bumped up a couple times to active conditions for just a short while. One of them was back on June 1st, and this was basically due to some fast solar wind that really wasn't all that fast or all that effective. So Aurora at high latitudes was kind of the name of the game, but nothing really down at mid latitudes. In fact, as we got this last little bump up from some fast solar wind from this coronal hole that's been passing through the Earth strike zone now. Well, again, we've only had a tiny bit of active conditions which brings aurora to high latitudes, but mid-latitude aurora photographers you've been kind of having to do without. However, you might get a chance here with this glancing blow from the solar storm, not expecting all that much, but it could bump us up to active conditions, possibly minor storm conditions, if that fast wind blows this thing and deflects it more into Earth view, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Now, taking a closer look at that solar storm that was launched back on the 4th, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NASA's version of the model, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at that solar storm being launched, you can see it's 
launching off to the west, but it does look like it could clip Earth about midday on the 7th. We're not expecting a really impressive blow, but it could be enough to give us a little bit of aurora, especially at high latitudes and possibly a chance down at mid latitudes. Now, also, if that fast solar wind from that coronal hole ends up deflecting the structure further into Earth, it could be a bigger blow than what we might have expected. So it's going to be kind of hard to tell, but Aurora photographers, if you're dedicated, you might actually get a chance for some more Aurora starting on the 7th. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at the view from Stereo A, you can see in the west that long filament, and you can actually watch it erupt slowly. That is the filament that actually launched that solar storm that looks like it's going to go west of Earth, but may graze us but right around the 7th. So that should get you oriented. And if you look past that to the east, you can see uh, two big bands, both in the north and in the south. These are a lot of active regions that are going to be rotating into view. In fact, when we take a look at the HMI helioseismology far side viewer, we can see a lot of dark regions, especially in the north. These are regions that look like they're going to be rotating into view here in about four days or so, and that could bring some real activity, including big flares and possibly more solar storm chances in the future. So next week, things in terms of activity could really ramp up. Switching to our moon and meteors, we are now coming out of our strawberry moon on our way to a third quarter, and by the 11th, the moon will be about 63% illuminated. So, Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch some aurora or some dim objects in the sky, well, you're going to have this bright companion, so you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that Earth-directed solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow starting around midday on the 7th. So at high latitudes, NOAA's expecting minor storm conditions, but we have up to about a 20% chance of a major storm. Now, activity could easily start right at, like I said, midday on the 7th, and we could ramp up to about the 8th and then have aurora clear in through the 9th before things begin to settle down. So at high latitudes, it should be a good show. Now at mid latitudes, however, NOAA's only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 10% chance of a minor storm. Again, the main time will be right around the 8th, but things should not last nearly as long. So aurora photographers, if you're at mid latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you bother to chase. Switching to your solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. Well, we do have quite a few active regions in Earth view, and that is boosting that solar flux. We are sitting in the 160s to 170s range, and this means good radio propagation on Earth's day side. The sad thing is that we do have moderate noise on the bands right now. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 30% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and as well as a 10% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout, and these conditions will easily extend through the rest of the five days here and possibly into next week because we have even more big flare players that are going to rotate into Earth view. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you're going to have to deal with periodic disruptions on Earth's day side on the bands with these radio blackouts, and if you are a GPS user, just understand, especially near dawn and near dusk, anywhere in that region, you can get GPS disruptions as well from these radio blackouts. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, we do have some flare activity this week, and that does mean that we are on alert when it comes to radiation storms. The good thing is, however, that we don't have any active radiation storms right now. In fact, we're sitting at the D1 normal range, and that is really where we should continue to be over the course of this week. We are having quiet conditions at the S0 level, so that is not a problem for any of you frequent flyers. However, because of the activity, NOAA is giving us about a 10% chance of an S1 to S2 level radio uh, uh, solar radiation storm. So if you are a pilot, be sure to check those ICAO advisories quite often. And if you are a drone pilot, be aware that there are radiation storms that could affect you if you happen to be crossing through the poles. 
So the space weather this week is definitely picking up in activity. We do have a partly Earth-directed solar storm that looks to graze Earth to the west about midday on the 7th. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a show. Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, only if you're dedicated should you chase. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, we do have a couple big flare players in Earth view. These are regions 3323 and 3327, and these regions are uh, do have big flare potential. So we could be seeing more radio blackouts here over this next week, but with moderate noise on the bands, at least your radio propagation is staying in the good range because solar flux continues to be high. And now GPS users, well, you know, things aren't too bad for you. We have some radio blackouts that could give you some issues, especially near dawn and near dusk. And we also have a little bit of aurora, but that aurora should kind of stay up at high latitudes. So overall, things should be pretty good. But this week, you definitely need to stay vigilant. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Right, well, my apologies, and uh, <laughs> gremlins in the system, I suppose. My apologies, that was an old old weather forecast. There is a new weather forecast that she's just put out less than a day ago, and I thought I had that queued up. In fact, I'm pretty sure I did, but um, there's a few other things I was trying to muck around with within vMix, and I ended up having to... Uh, to start things all over again and it seems that I, I brought in an old uh, space weather report so uh, my apologies for that but I rather than rip it off halfway through I thought no I'll, I'll stick to um, the professional side of it and run it through uh, especially for those that um, uh, think that Timoth is uh, interesting to uh, to listen to so, <laughs> so uh, anyway if there's time at the end of the interview with uh, Greg Sleep, I'll run the most current episode of spaceweather.com. It's it's there. I've brought it in, and it's ready to go. Um, it just depends on uh, how uh, how the timing goes. So apologies for that. Um, for those that didn't particularly pick on pick up on the dates, but anybody watching the video side of it would have seen the dates and would have figured that's a bit old. My apologies again. Anyways, that's fine. All right, let's get into uh, into this interview. So let me just uh, queue it up. And the first thing I'll do is just a bit of a, a spiel on it. And, uh, and then we'll go into it. So uh, I think just a, just a sec. All right. You're tuned to ASV Radio VK3 EKH with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ. Now, coming up uh, is a interview that Brendan O'Brien did just a few weeks ago with uh, Greg Sleep. And uh, Greg Sleep uh, is a uh, soft software and systems team leader at the CIRA, the Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy. Um, and uh, he discusses the Murchison Wild Wide Field Array, WMWA, and its role in capturing radio data from the cosmos. The Murchison Wide Field uh, is a low-frequency radio telescope array located in remote Western Australia, and uh, it is used for various scientific studies, including the search for for the signals of the epoch of reionization, detecting black hole radio jets, transients, GRBs and uh, FRBs and pulsars and SETI research uh, and uh, studying supernova remnants and monitoring space junk. The MWA has been successful in producing uh, over 300 journal papers and is preparing for future developments including the use of all 256 tiles uh, antennas and the collaboration with the Square Kilometre Array SKA telescope project. Glenn Sleep, S-L-E-A-P, 
is in the thick of it. He's well and truly involved with um, uh, what's going on and his uh, journey into this is rather interesting how it all started for him. So I sit back and relax and listen to this uh, interview. Um, Greg does most of the talking, of course, and I think that's the uh, part that's, uh, uh, of course, worth listening to. Um, of course, there's no vision with this. It's just audio. But for those with the YouTube and uh, the TV, I'll, I'll just have a caption up of Greg. A picture of Greg with a slow-moving uh, satellite or International Space Station view of uh, flying over the Earth whilst it's going on. I thought that's the best I could do for the time. So, um, yeah, anyway, I uh, hope you uh, enjoy listening to uh, this interview. This is VK, and I'll, like I say, I'll stop it occasionally just to uh, give announcements of uh, the station here. This is ASV Radio VK3CSJ, sorry, EKH. <laughs> there it is, <laughs> VK3 EKH. There it is. All right, stand by, stand by, stand by, stand by. Let's get this going. Guest to introduce to you. Today, you're going to discover and understand the data wizardry involved in capturing the petabytes of astro data from immense radio telescope arrays, correlating and channeling that data to supercomputers and then making it available to researchers all over the world, who in turn create all those stunning images that enable us to understand our previously unseeable universe. This guy and his multidisciplinary team are absolute wizards at their work. Hold on, here he is now. Hello, Greg. Hi, Brendan. Today I'm really pleased to be speaking with Greg Sleep. Greg is a software and systems team leader at Kyra, the Curtin Institute of Radio Astronomy which is a node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, ICRA, in Perth, Western Australia. Kyra manages the Murchison Widefield Array Project, known affectionately as the MWA, a low-frequency radio telescope array of spider antennas in remote Western Australia, which is a precursor to the Square Kilometre Array Telescope, the world's largest radio telescope. The SKA will require the collection, correlation and distribution of unimaginable amounts of radio data pulled in from the cosmos. For those who love numbers, the SKA Low Telescope will generate about 8 terabytes per second, 24-7, for 365 days per year, which is then analysed by astrophysicists all over the world. And it's Greg's job to make sure they get it. So thanks for speaking with us today, Greg. How are you, Brendan? Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Excellent. So before we look at your world of data and your current work at Kyra, can you tell us where you grew up, please, Greg, and where your curiosity and drive to understand and manage data came from? Sure. I was born in Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory in Australia. It's nice and cold there, not too far from where we are now. And yeah, as a family, we moved across to Perth when I was about six years old for the warmer climate. And yeah, I sort of had this fascination and love for space, astronomy, stars, science fiction ever since I can remember, really. And I think one of the things that inspired me was that I was given a book as a kid, probably when I was about four or five years old, called You Shall Go to the Moon. And the book would have been written in the 60s sometime because it was full of diagrams and things. And, and the story was basically unfolding about the first trip to the moon. And of course, obviously, in 1969, that became reality. So this book was predating that. But I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the idea that space is a place. It's not just a background of stars that we see when we walk out and look up at the night sky. 
it's real places you can go to and explore. And I must have had my grandmother read that story to me millions of times. I just, yeah, fell in love with it. Um, and the final page of the book actually is this father and his son standing on the moon in their spacesuits, and they look up and point at Mars. And the dad says, the next stop will be there. Oh. Um, and and that really was an exciting way to end the book. So I think definitely my love of space and astronomy absolutely started back then. Wow, that's great, Greg. Sounds like it was a bit prescient because collectively we're all doing the same thing right now. Okay, so please tell us a little bit about those early school days and your earliest ambitions and how those ambitions might have evolved, Greg. Yeah, so the love of space and astronomy was sort of always in the background, but I quickly started to also have a second love, which was computers. So my dad would bring home from work what was called a luggable computer. So this is before there were laptops and notebooks and things. So it was basically a briefcase-sized computer that was portable. He would bring that home, do some work on it. And when he was finished with work, I would ask if I could have a play on it. And he would set me up so that I had something simple like a text editor or something like that. And I would spend hours just playing on this computer. And that really sparked my love of computing. And even early in primary school, we were one of the first schools to get a BBC microcomputer. You don't see them anymore these days. And that computer had a whole range of software on it for kids, games and puzzles and, and that sort of thing, and some programming as well. And so starting year four, I really realized that this is a thing I want to get into. And so during my school years, we gradually got computer labs at school and at high school. And I would spend a lot of my time writing little programs, modifying existing programs. When I finally got a computer at home, which was an Amstrad, that's another brand you don't hear of anymore, I would uh, get my mum and dad to buy me computer magazines that had listings of programs in there, and you would actually sit there and type them out into the computer and then run them, and it would be like a game of Solitaire or Pac-Man or, or something like that. And I just loved doing that, and I loved modifying the programs and seeing what I could do if I changed them. And all this time as well, I was also knee-deep in astronomy magazines as well, drooling over all of the shiny telescopes and all the beautiful images that were coming back from space, including one of the biggest impacts on me was the Voyager 2 mission. When we first saw images of Uranus and Neptune for the first time, that really had a big impact on me. But I think probably the biggest impact throughout high school actually was Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm a big sci-fi nerd and have always been, but when Star Trek Next Generation came on, on the little screen, I think it honestly changed my life. It really changed the way I thought about what science is and what engineering is. Star Trek upheld all these values of what it is to be a good person, what it is to actually be in a society that values knowledge and intelligence. And of course, they're exploring the stars in spaceships and shooting phases everywhere. So what was there not to like, really? <laughs> Fantastic. I share quite a few of those experiences. For me, I think my favourite is Blake 7 and a computer known as ORAC. But let's go on with your career. After school, you completed your Bachelor of Commerce with a focus on IT at the Curtin Business School in Perth, Western Australia. And some years later, you did your master's in astronomy at James Cook University in Townsville up in Queensland, right up on the other side of Australia, 5,000 kilometres away. But before we talk about that, would you like to mention some of the people or circumstances that influenced your shift from the world of business to astronomy? Yeah, sure thing. So when I got out of university, I'd really gone fully into the IT side of my passions. And at the time, I thought that that was really 
the only place I could take it. So going into corporate IT and working as a software developer would be the only way that I could actually exercise that passion. And I didn't think there was any chance of me getting any job in astronomy since I wasn't an astronomer. And I didn't realize that there were all these careers possible that didn't actually require you to be an astronomer, but you could work within the field. Yep. So initially, I didn't make that connection. and But in the early 2000s, there was more and more information about the Square Kilometre Array project, which Australia was bidding to host. Yep. And that got me thinking that if I did want to start to combine my love of IT with my love of astronomy, that I'd need to actually do something to separate myself from the average applicant. So I realised more and more that modern astronomy is data-based astronomy and computing-based astronomy. Yep. So to get my foot in the door, I thought, well, what's better than combining IT and astronomy by getting some sort of qualification in astronomy? So I found the astronomy master's course and James Cook Uni was where I finished, but I actually started at University of Western Sydney. The, The course started there and then we transferred. So doing the master's in astronomy was a way to get my foot in the door and to be noticed when there are a bunch of resumes out there for some sort of computing job for the SKA, for example. And having that Master of Astronomy, I thought, would actually help me quite a bit. Interestingly enough, the course was external. And so it was fully online while I was working full time. But I loved every minute of it. Because my my passion in astronomy had been very, I guess, surface level, I hadn't really dug into it too much. And I never really did the the high level maths and physics at high school. So for me, this course was brilliant. It was a master's by coursework and we covered everything from particle physics, the electromagnetic spectrum, planetary science, stellar evolution, galactic evolution, cosmology, quantum mechanics, just the whole gamut. And I learned so much and I actually kind of kicked myself for not going, for not taking the the physics and maths in high school and actually pursuing maybe a a more direct astronomy career. Yep. And the interesting thing is that at the time, so this is back in, I graduated in 2005, the funny part of that course was that there was only a small portion of the syllabus devoted to radio astronomy. So radio astronomy was still quite a niche field, I guess, in within Australia at that time. Obviously, there were some prominent radio astronomy observatories operating, for example, like Parks. But in this course, it was mainly focused on optical astronomy. But I am very glad I did it. And it really made me more determined to try to find my way in and get an astronomy job. Okay, very good. Look, let's go into that a bit. You've mentioned getting your foot in the door in astronomy. So let's go back a bit. And you started off as a coder, then a software developer, systems analyst, server management, sysadmin, IT team letter in the business and mining industries. But then you landed at the MWA, the Murchison Widefield Array, as said, data manager. How did you land that job, Greg? Yeah, so... The job itself came up in quite an interesting way. I didn't actually realize that the job was available. So I'd been sitting on the couch, not having a good day. And I realized that on my my calendar on my phone, it was telling me that the Curtin University Astrofest was on that night. And I was feeling lazy and I thought, I can't be bothered going. Anyway, then I thought about what else I would be doing that night. And at the time, there was nothing else going on. So I thought, ah, I should just go to Astrofest. So I took myself down to Astrofest and came across this strange looking piece of mesh on the ground with 16 spider shaped antennas all clutched to it and a little box where all the antennas were connected to. And so I asked the gentleman that was tending that weird thing, what the heck is this and what do you do? Anyway, it turns out that the person that I was talking to was a member of the MWA operations team and that we were standing right next to one of the MWA tiles. 
Anyway, he went and explained to me all about the MWA and how it worked. And then he asked me some questions about my background. What do I do? So I was explaining that I work in the mining industry, but in an IT capacity. And I deal with lots of data and business intelligence and, and all that sort of stuff. And he then said, oh, well, you'd sound perfect for the job. Why don't you apply? Huh. I'm like, what job? So he then pointed me to the relevant job ad on the Curtin University website. And I applied. And that's how I ended up here in the MWA operations team. Yeah. That's a great story. Okay, so you started off as their data manager, and to me, that sounds like an oversimplification of your role that you had there originally, because I looked at your CV and the job involved software engineering, network admin, server admin, procurement, deployment, the management of Kyra's IT system, all with the purpose of supporting various large-scale big data radio astronomy instruments. Now, I'm pretty sure you didn't spend all your time wrangling a keyboard, Greg. Would you like to remind our listeners about what the MWA is? And you just mentioned the spiders. What did it look like out on site when you went there for the first time and you visited? Was that in, what, 2015, 2016? Yeah, so I think my first trip up to where the MWA is, which is the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, or shortened to the MRO, which has recently received a name from the Wadri Yamaji people of Inyari, Mana, Ilgari, Bundara, which means sharing the sky and stars. Oh, that's cool. So that's the site where it's located. So it's about three and a half hours drive northeast of Geraldton. So for people that don't know Western Australia, that's basically in the middle in terms of the north and south and middle east or and a few hundred kilometres from the coast as well. Out in the desert, you're talking red dirt, lots of heat in summer. So 50 degrees plus it can easily get to out there and quite cold in winter as well overnight. It is an amazing place. So that was my first impression of it. Yeah, 2016 or so went up there because... Whenever we get a new starter, we try to get them up to see the MWA for itself so they can actually get an understanding of the physicality of the instrument. Yep. And when I went up there, the the spiders looked a lot smaller than they do when they're up close, when you're looking at them out the, the window of the car or whatever. And we were tasked actually with working out why one of the tiles wasn't working. So a tile is, is just basically... 16 of these spider-shaped antennas together we group them together in a tile and so we had to work out why one of these tiles wasn't working anymore so we drove out there and then stomped across into the bush for a bit and looked down and saw that the beamformer box which is the, the little box that takes all of the 16 dipoles signals together and allows us to point the telescope in any direction without actually any moving parts so that box had been completely broken and ripped out of its location and around the place where the beamformer box was lying were these what looked like kangaroo tracks (laughs) so we surmised that a random kangaroo had just hopped along got its foot or leg caught in the cables and because they're powerful creatures just ripped them out and went off on its merry way okay greg um look can you just paint the picture of What is the MWA, the Murchison Wide Field Array? So the MWA, which also, by the way, has a Wadri Yamaji name, which is Gurgle Manu, which means the ear that listens to the sky, which I think is super cool. Yeah. It's a low frequency radio telescope. So that means that we're looking for radio waves or we're sensitive to radio waves that are in the meter scale so you're looking at sort of a meter two meters long in wavelength and we have 144 of those tiles that i mentioned before we actually have 256 deployed but we can only use 144 at a time and that's a limitation of the number of receivers we have so the receivers we currently have 18 deployed and 
they're very specialized, quite expensive bits of equipment. And the job of those is to take the signals coming in from eight of the tiles, and then they digitize that and split it into lots of little frequency channels. In fact, 256 of them. The astronomer that is currently operating the telescope selects 24 of those 256 and we throw the rest away. The reason for that is it's just too much data to deal with and 24 channels is actually quite a nice amount for most of the science cases that we have. So just getting back a bit, the telescope itself covers the same band as FM radio and TV frequencies. So it's really important that we minimize any sort of interference which can completely contaminate any sort of signals that we're receiving from space yep the signals we're receiving from space are so weak that even just a a transmission from many hundred kilometers away can easily overwhelm any sort of signal we're getting from space and that also includes things like wi-fi bluetooth mobile phones so when we're up the Murchison, we within a radio quiet zone where you're not allowed to operate any of these radio devices except in an emergency. And that has really helped to make sure that the MWA takes really good data that's very free of interference and that lets us actually do a lot better science. The MWA was actually conceived and funded and built by a collaboration from about 20 different institutions around the world. So we've got member institutions in Australia, USA, China, Japan, and Canada. And previous members that we've had have included New Zealand, India. So it is a truly international project. And Curtin gets the the lucky job of being the lead organization to actually operate and maintain the telescope on behalf of the collaboration. So keeping the radio environment quiet is super important. So much so that we'll CSIRO provide a control building up near the MWA, which houses a lot of CSIRO servers and equipment and also ours. And it's actually inside a Faraday cage. So to enter the building, you've got to go through an airlock yep. to get in and out of the building and that's basically you going in and out of the Faraday cage, which basically blocks any stray radio transmissions from going outside of that room. And it's very important to mention as well that the MRO actually is not just for the MWA, of course. The CSIRO, which is the Australian government's science agency, they have their own telescope up there called ASCAP, which is the Australian SKA Pathfinder. It's basically made of 36 dishes. And they are also a radio telescope as well, but they're operating at a different frequency than us. So they're at higher sort of frequencies and we're in the low frequency end. There's also EDGES, which is a little instrument. It's actually quite modest looking, but its job is to look for the cosmic dawn. Um, and that's operated by Arizona State University. And of course, the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory is also the home to the future SKA low as well so you have this one location it's radio quiet and we've got all these instruments up there taking advantage of the beautiful remoteness of the location the other thing that i did notice when i first went up there was all the different flora and fauna up there kangaroos as we've mentioned there's wedge-tailed eagles ants snakes bungaras which are monitor lizards and of course it's very hot and dusty Still, it's an amazing place, and every chance that I get to go up there, I take it, even though most of the time I'm working inside the control building, installing servers and plugging in cables and things of like that, but it's still just an amazing experience. Ooh. Uh, this is VK3. EKH, you're listening to a uh, podcast broadcast uh, a recording from astrophys.com and uh, you're listening to um, an interview between Brendan O'Brien and uh, Greg Sleep. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. Cool. 
Fantastic. And can you mention some of the science that's happening that's coming out of the MWA? Yeah, so the MWA is quite a versatile instrument. It's got a, quite a wide field of view and we can actually process or analyze data in many different ways. And so that allows us to do a lot of different science. Some of the primary science that the MWA was intended for is searching for the signal of the epoch of reionization. And this is where I'm not an astronomer and probably can't explain it very well, but effectively it's the light from the first stars in the universe. So we're talking 13 billion years ago, which because they were emitted back that long ago, the universe has expanded since then. And as the universe expands over those 13.7 billion years, it's actually redshifted the light from the visible spectrum down into the radio spectrum. So the wavelengths of light have actually expanded. And when you're talking wavelengths that are in the meter, two meter range, that's right bang where we're sensitive to with the MWA. So Whoa. the MWA is actually a really good epoch of reionization machine. Fantastic, Greg. Uh, does the MWA see black holes? Yeah, Brendan. So the MWA is really good at detecting the radio jets that get emitted from supermassive black holes at the heart of most galaxies. They come out as big streaming jets sort of above and below. And that's something that we're really good at detecting. And in fact, a lot of the sources that MWA detects as part of the Gleam survey are actually the jets coming out of the supermassive black holes at the heart of galaxies. But the MWA also does a whole heap of other science as well, including detecting supernova remnants. There's also transients, so that's like pulsars and fast radio bursts. The fast radio bursts is, a, is quite a new area for the MWA, and we haven't had any detections yet, but we've had a program of searching for them. And we've been able to put some limits on what the FRBs would look like through the MWA. Yep. And there's also lots of studies going on with the sun. The sun is a big emitter of radio waves, believe it or not. Yep. And the ionosphere as well. So we can detect plasma tubes that are in the Earth's ionosphere with the MWA. Cool. And there's also a fledgling SETI search going on, which uses basically a, a copy of the MWA data. So when the MWA is observing any other source, a copy of that data goes into a special set of machines which run some SETI pipelines, which look for any sort of signals or anything that might be of interest coming from advanced civilizations. Um, they're called techno signatures. And I've been working with the team on that one. So that's been quite an exciting thing to work on. And MWA is also uh, doing some space situational awareness. So the really interesting thing is that if you have a radio transmitter, a powerful one, say in the local town of Geraldton, which is about 350 kilometers away, that transmitter is transmitting in all directions, including up. So when you have any sort of satellite or let's say some space debris from a rocket that has been spent in orbit, any sort of debris like that, these radio waves will actually bounce off those pieces of debris and we can detect that with the MWA. Cool. And so that allows us to effectively monitor the sky for space junk, which is becoming an increasingly massive problem for launch operators and satellite operators in being able to find a, a bit of orbit that isn't contaminated with space junk that could potentially damage or destroy spacecraft. So I guess that, that's a pretty good roundup of, of all the science. The MWA does surveys as well, so that's where you basically point at all of the sky that you have access to, which for the MWA is, is most of the southern sky and a little bit of the northern sky. And so one of the surveys there that I mentioned before was Gleam. That's probably been the biggest survey for MWA and the most used by other astronomers. But there's work going on on a thing called the SMART survey, 
which is basically a southern sky survey of all the pulsars. So the idea is to look for all of these pulsars. There's predicted to be many fines, hundreds, I think. And they've already discovered a couple through this survey and is going to be a treasure trove of data for scientists to pour through for many, many years. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, I guess the, the final thing with the MWA is that it's going to be very useful for the upcoming SKA low. So as the SKA low gets built, the MWA will be used to test the SKA low. So there'll be observations done on both telescopes and they'll be comparing the data that comes back from both and making sure that the SKA low is actually working properly, yep. which actually is a lot trickier than it sounds. Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, Gleam is a fantastic survey. The imagery that's come out of Gleam is just beautiful. If people want to go and have a look at that, just look up some Gleam images. You'll be blown away. Now, Greg, in previous episodes, we've interviewed many ICRA scientists who have used your data from the MWA and from ASCAP arrays to make some beautiful scientific discoveries. We've talked with Phil Edwards, with Melanie Johnson Pollard, Stephen Tingay, and Natasha Hurley Walker. And there's other scientists there who are leading the MWA and the ASCAP projects. And even uh, your colleague, you've got an engineer, Mia Walker. If people want to go back and listen to that episode, Mia does a fantastic job. And so many of our listeners will have some background knowledge of your data collecting instruments. But before we talk about big data and the Pawsey Centre and the development of the future SKA, could you bring us up to date with where is the MWA right now? How is the infrastructure developing what does the data flow look like now and what lies in the future for the MWA? Yeah, great questions. So the MWA is operating great. We have 256 deployed tiles, but we are only using 144 at the moment. But we're working on getting some new receivers, which will allow us to utilize all 256 tiles at once. And what that does is that gives us a lot more sensitivity and also it allows scientists to have a bigger range of baselines. Now, in radio astronomy, when you've got an interferometer where you've got lots and lots and lots of antennas or dishes, the baselines are a really important factor as to the performance of the telescope. So if you've got long baselines, which is just the distance between any two of the antennas or tiles, so long baselines allow you to see with greater resolution and short baselines let you see more emissions and nebulous features. Yep. And so having a mix of these baselines is, is really great as well. So once we get to 256 tiles, that will really be unleashing the full potential of the MWA. Yep. We've been producing all of this great science in all the science areas. And there's been over 300 papers published on MWA data and many thousands of citations of those papers, which really just goes to show that the MWA is really pulling its weight when it comes to furthering our knowledge of the universe. We've only recently installed a new correlator for the MWA called MWAX. And the correlator is a computing cluster that sits up at the Murchison and it takes all of the data from all the receivers. And so each receiver has eight tiles. So we basically get all the data from the receivers. And what the correlator's job is to split the, the data into more fine channels. So you've got lots and lots and lots of these little fine channels. And it takes the signal from every single tile and multiplies it against every other tile. Wow. So you can imagine this is a really big computational machine and what that allows us to do is to basically record what the common signal is from all of the tiles. So when you think about a radio source that might be overhead, 
of the MWA, then all of the tiles should actually see that signal around about the same way and same same amount of power and and same phase, which is just basically talking about where the wave actually strikes the antenna. But if you've got a source of interference that's off to the east somewhere, for example, so maybe it's a car driving past, and we've actually seen that cars spark plugs can actually cause interference. So whenever the spark goes off, we see a little spike Ooh. in the data. So we don't even want cars to be driving past when we're observing. And so that spark would come from one direction. And so the tiles that are on that side of the array closest to the car will see that signal more. The tiles that are further away see that signal less or they see it with lower power. And so when you do this cross multiplication, those sort of stray signals don't actually get as much power when you add up all of the signals from all of the tiles. So probably radio astronomers listening to this, they're probably shaking their heads at my explanation. But from an IT guy's point of view, I'm, I'm happy with that. So that's generally what we use the correlator to do. And I was privileged enough to work on that project. So I was in charge of making sure that the data moves between all the different stages of the correlator. And then once it gets out of the correlator, that it goes down to our archive at the Pawsey Center. The other things that I'll just mention as to why the new correlator was so important is apart from going to 256 tiles, it also let us operate in all these different modes, which we couldn't do before, which gives astronomers more choice as to how they want their data. And it allows us to capture special triggers. So other observatories, especially space-based observatories, might detect some big flash of like a gamma ray burst, for example. And we know from the study of gamma ray bursts that after the initial flash of gamma rays, there's a radio emission as well. And that radio emission is usually delayed by a short amount of time because lower power than the gamma rays. And the radio waves take a bit longer to propagate through space. And so we get a trigger from that, an electronic trigger that tells our telescope that a GRB has gone off and to go and point there and take some data so that we can look at the radio emission from the GRB. So it's things like that that are really cool. And also, as I mentioned before, the SETI backend is what's called a commensal instrument. So it takes a copy of the data and does its own thing. And we're working on some fast radio burst commensal pipeline as well. So there'll be another copy of the data that will go and just be there to feed machines that will be looking for fast radio bursts. Ooh. And so some components have been out in the field for 10 years. So 2013 is when we started operations. So they're doing really well considering, although we do have quite an active fieldwork team who go out there and replace components all the time. We get kangaroos, we get uh, <laughs> lightning, we get ants who decide that it's a really fun thing to go up into electronics and then they end up shorting out <laughs> electronics sometimes as well. And finally, the MW archive, which is more my thing I look after, we're sitting at 48 petabytes Ooh. storage, and that's at the Pawsey Center, and that's on a mix of tape and disk, and that's been collected over the last 10 years. And we try to keep as much of that as possible because we store what's called raw data. So there's other observatories who don't have the luxury that we do of storing the raw data. So they store science products, which have been processed in a very specific way. And as you go along those processing pipelines, you're effectively narrowing the reuse of that data, but it massively reduces the size of it. We're able to keep the raw data. And that means that astronomers who initially requested the time on the telescope to take data can process it the way that they want for their science case and then once it's out of the embargo period then other astronomers can come along and say well hang on a sec there's this beautiful data for this target that i'm interested in but i need to process it in this other way and they can go off and do that and in fact one of our researchers is leading a team uh, natasha hurley walker she's leading a team that is looking for 
transients in the MWA archive. So this is just going back through old data that was used by other people for other things and then finding if there's any radio source that blinks on and blinks off. And she's already discovered a couple of these things with some nature papers published about them as well. And they're still a bit of a mystery because these things blink on and off with strange periods that don't sort of conform to the current menagerie of things that could be producing them like pulsars, magnetars and other things. Whoa. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Sensational, beautiful science. Well, the MWA has certainly stamped itself in the world of science. Look, in your role as Kyra Software and Systems Team Leader, I know that you don't specifically work for the Square Kilometre Array, but can I ask you a couple of questions about the future developments there of the SKA? What were the big lessons that you've learnt in the development of the MWA that are going to guide the work in getting the SKA data systems online? And secondly, I believe the contracts have been awarded and construction of SKA Low has begun out on that remote site in the desert and scrubland. And do you know what the construction timeline is and when can we expect the first science data to flow into the SKA? Sure. So in terms of the lessons learnt, I guess there's many and they range all the way from the physicality of the Murchison and the harsh environment and how to make equipment that can stand the test of time and to, to withstand the elements that are out there. One thing I hadn't mentioned before is that as well as all the heat and, and the dry and the dust, we also get floods up there too. So when it rains, the rain has nowhere to go and the ground is very hard. So it just ends up forming these river channels <laughs> that, uh, that run through. And so our equipment needs to be able to withstand all of that as well. So that's probably one of the, the big lessons. And it's one of the lessons that Kyra has been working with the design team on what's called the AAVS, which is the Aperture Array Verification System. Yep. So it's uh, one of the pre-construction tasks of the SKA. And so Kyra engineers have been working with a group of Italian engineers to design what the SKA low antennas will look like and some of the field electronics. And all of that stuff is stuff that they've been taking into account and learning from us and going out there with our group to experience those harsh conditions. Aside from that, in terms of the data challenge and the processing and computing challenge, the SKA scale is a huge jump up from the likes of the MWA. MWA is big enough and keeps us very busy, but SKA is another whole level altogether. So one of the lessons we've found with managing the MWA data with quite modest hardware, I guess, if you can divide and conquer, then the job is much easier. Yep. So instead of building one big computer, split the job up so that it can run on lots of smaller computers. So for example, our correlator that's up at the MWA, MWAX, it consists of 24 servers, each with lots of RAM, lots of disks and GPUs. So that's graphical processor units, which you know you might find in your home computer. These ones are data center grade ones. And we process those 24 channels I spoke about. Each channel goes into a different server. So that way we didn't need to build one massive computer that could handle 24 channels. We build 24 computers that can handle one channel each. And so that for us was one of the ways that we can manage with this huge flow of data. The other thing that we've learned, and I think this is pretty common with big data projects, is that you try to keep your processing and your code near the data. Like, don't try to move the data to where you can process it because it's just too big and the infrastructure to move petabyte uh, scale data sets is just not there. We, for example, have a 100 gigabit link that goes from the MWA down into the Pawsey Center. 
and that's a big link. So 100 gigabits is the equivalent of about a thousand home NBN connections or home internet connections at 100 megabit. So that's a big connection there, and that is nowhere near enough for the SKA data. Amazing. We also spent a lot of time optimizing the software and hardware that we have. So if you just use things out of the box, they're going to be suboptimal. So we spent a lot of time testing, a lot of time simulating with test data before we actually put anything up at the Murchison. And there's many lessons. For example, yeah, keeping the archive as long as possible. Um, for us at the MWA, lots of hidden treasures in there that we haven't discovered yet. However, with the SKA, the current funding model, I guess, only really allows the final data products to be stored, not the raw data. And that's just because the data sets are just too big. And with the cost of storage and moving that size data, what they do is they will get the data coming out of the telescope, apply processing to it, which the astronomer who has requested time on the telescope will have input into. And then at the end of it, the astronomer will get the exact sort of science product that they are after. Yep. If they've made a mistake, they'll have to reobserve with the telescope. Yep. With the MWA, if you make a mistake processing the data, then you just process it a different way again, using that same raw data. Yep. And so that's the, the big difference there. But with the SKA, it's just not possible to use that model. So that's probably where the MWA and SKA differ quite significantly in how we deal with that data. That's so cool. Answering your second question about the schedule and the timeline, the SKA organization, the SKAO, has published a, I guess, a preliminary schedule of construction. Obviously, there's big asterisks because, as we know, there's uh, shortages of workers in the world at the moment, post-pandemic. There's also supply chain issues. So at the moment, the idea is that by about early 2024, there should be six stations now, in SKA terminology, a station is the same as what we would call a tile. So an SKA station consists of 256 antennas, whereas one of our tiles is 16 antennas. So there'll be six stations in early 2024. And then the year after that, it'll grow to 18 stations. Two years after that, 256 stations. So that's quite a big leap in those two years. Yep. And... The current plan is that by late 2027, all the stations should be deployed, which will be the full SKA low phase one array. And the construction complete milestone, I guess, would be nearer to mid or late 2029. So it's going to take quite a while to build and commission. And throughout the whole construction process, as each of these milestones is reached with six 18, 256 stations, the data will actually be flowing throughout that whole time. It won't be for end users and scientists. It'll be for the commissioning team who are there to make sure that the telescope actually works. And there might be some early adopter astronomers who put up their hand to spend time to debug things, to analyze where there might be issues. With telescopes like this, it's incredibly complex. And there are lots and lots and lots of wires, if you can imagine. And so all it takes is for, you know, a, a wire that should be plugged into X to be accidentally plugged into Y. And suddenly those signals are now reversed. And those sort of issues are, are really subtle and difficult to detect. So there's going to be a lot of work for a lot of people to iron out all those little bugs and to get the thing working. But it will all be very much worth it when the first science comes through, which I'm not sure exactly when that would be, but I'm guessing that would be around that construction complete time is when the first sort of production science would be occurring. You're tuned to VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Radio, of um, Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast, and you're listening to a podcast interview between Brendan O'Brien and... Uh, Greg Sleep. Um, we're almost uh, com uh, coming to the conclusion of this one. 
I uh, hope you're enjoying it. This is VK3CSJ. Sorry, VK3EKH. Oh, what an astonishing project. You must be so lucky to be working on the MWA um, as a SK precursor, Greg. Okay, so that's the background, the projects, the people, the telescopes, the antennas. Look, you've been hinting at the magnitude of the data and how it's managed, and we're probably talking about zettabytes of data coming in for just the SKA low alone. Then you've got all of those instruments over in South Africa, the other part of the SKA. Can you talk about that big picture of what happens to the data after it's sucked out of the sky by all of those beautiful antennas, those dipoles. It's correlated with your WMAX correlator. And how does it end up on the screens of astrophysicists all out of the world? You've hinted at it. How do you move such vast amounts of data so far and so quickly and maintain its integrity? Sure, yeah. So as as you mentioned, the the data coming through the tiles then goes to receivers, then goes into the correlator. Out of the correlator, we then have a 100 gig link. It actually goes first to Curtin University. We've got uh, some servers there which maintain some temporary storage. So the idea is that if there's any issues with the next step in the chain, which is pushing the data into the Pawsey archive, then it'll just fill up the disks that are sitting in Curtin. From Curtin, there's another 100 gig link that goes across to Pawsey. And once it goes into Pawsey, it goes into one of two archiving systems. So either Acacia, which is based on disk, or Anxia, which is based on tape. And we've got allocations in both, and we shuffle between the two, depending on the capacity that we have and where the data is best suited. The stuff that's on tape has a little bit of a longer latency to get it out again when an astronomer requests it, but it's actually pretty quick, usually within sort of 10 minutes. And the Acacia storage is disk, so it's very fast. So you, you put it in there and you can get it out again reasonably fast. So once it's sitting in the archive, users around the world uh, use our MWA All Sky Virtual Observatory, ASVO portal, and that portal is a web-based interface and we also have command line interface as well for people that uh, love to do the command line stuff and not anything on the web and that allows users to select or to find the data first and then to go and download the data and optionally we can do some kind of pre-processing steps to it so the sort of things that the astronomer will have to do because it is raw data we, we have to pre-process it and we can do it for them or they can do it themselves. And they do it using supercomputers generally. The, the data, even at the MWA level, is too big for users to process on their own laptops or on their own desktop. Yep. So Pawsey have various supercomputers available. So there's Garawala, uh, which is the MWA sort of dedicated one. And there's also Satonix as well. But we have users all around the world. So for the users that work on the Pawsey systems, the data doesn't actually move very far to get to them. And that's actually really great. So that's keeping that concept of keep the code near the data or keep the data near the code. So users that are using Pawsey systems have this benefit of the fact that they're doing their analysis on computers that are right next to the data. But we have researchers all the way around the world, including Japan, USA, China, etc. So they actually need to either be able to apply for and, and get computing time at Pawsey, but if they can't, then they'll need to actually download the data across the wire. And depending on the internet connections between Pawsey and, and their supercomputer, that can be either really nice or really painful, depending on their institution and the bandwidth that they have available to them. We've found that even like a sort of a regular data set for MWA that has been pre-processed, which means it's also been reduced a bit, ends up around the 100 to 300 gigabytes. And we've found that most of the institutions that work with MWA data have reasonably 
high bandwidth internet connections, which means that they can download that size of data in hours, not days, Yep, which helps. And I guess this is the, the contrast in between MWA and SKA. So that's sort of how the MWA astronomers get their data and then process it. So they work on a supercomputer that does it. With SKA, most of the same process applies. So the data goes from the antennas through various other equipment, through a correlator, and it will eventually come down to PAUSI in the science data processor, so SDP. So this is an SKA low or SKA computing facility, which will do a lot of the pre-processing. It will also do some actual processing. So it will actually go and create images, for example, or spectra or image cubes, various other products that the scientists use. And then from there, the data will be transmitted across to various SKA regional centers. So the budget for the SKA project itself did not include money to fund the final step of processing the data for astronomers. Oh. So all of the member countries are having to put up their own money and funding to build these SKA regional centers that will both house the data and process the data for astronomers. So this is a big job and there's currently one of the team members that works on my team is also working with the SKA Regional Centre project for Australia, so the Oz SRC, and they are uh, finding it a fascinating project to work on because they've got the difficult job of making all this look easy for the astronomers. So they've got to take this data deluge that will come out of Pawsey for the SKLO, and there's an equivalent for the SKA mid in Southern Africa. So they've got to take this data deluge and process the data and basically run a supercomputing facility and design how the software will work, how users will interact with the system. And so all of that is all happening right now so that they're ready in six or seven years time for this to all come online. And just answering your other question about how we move such vast quantities of data around and so fast, all of that is thanks to high-speed networks around the country and around the world. So within Australia, Arnet is the provider of educational research networks, and they've basically built an 800 kilometer fiber link between the Murchison and Perth. And that's where we send all of our data. The link is actually being built specifically to have capacity for the SKA. So the amount of glass that's in the ground, because fiber optic is basically glass, is approximately uh, several terabits, as I understand it. It may actually be more now, but certainly as of a few years ago, it's a few terabits. And one terabit is a thousand gigabits a second. Whoa. We only use a small fraction of that, uh, so we just use the 100 gigabits. But yeah, the SKA load will need all of the bandwidth it can get to get the data down to Pawsey. The other thing we do is we ensure that we haven't lost any data by taking checksums of the data as soon as we produce it. And a checksum is a mathematical computation done to the data that you can use to then read back the data and recompute the checksum. And if any single bit of the data has changed, the checksum will be different. So as long as the checksum that you computed when you created the data matches the checksum of the data at the other end, so that could be at Pawsey, or if you're a researcher getting the data onto your supercomputer to start work on it, as long as those checksums match, then we know that the data has not been modified, corrupted, or anything bad happened to it. Okay, checksums, fingerprints. Okay, thanks, Greg. <laughs> now, one thing we haven't talked much about on this show is the Pawsey Centre. You've referred to it a few times now. Will the Pawsey be part of the data infrastructure for the SKA, and or will they have to install new supercomputers to process all that SKA data. 
Sure. Yes, so palsy will be a key element of the SKA low process. Palsy has been a long-time partner and supporter of the MWA. In fact, we sort of say that we grew up together. So the Palsy Supercomputer Center started around the same time as the MWA began, and the MWA gradually ramped up the amount of data that goes through Pawsey as Pawsey was upgrading its systems to handle that data. So over time, we've sort of both grown together and they've been such a, a great supporter of the MWA and basically allowed MWA to maintain this massive archive, which of course bears dividends with researchers being able to access that archive and make discoveries. So the science data processor is the component of the SKA that will likely reside in Pawsey. And I'm not 100% privy to this, but I believe that they would be building new infrastructure to support that. So new supercomputers, potentially, just because it is such a huge computational effort to do the job of the SDP, which, as I mentioned before, was pre-processing and processing of the data to get it to a form that can then go to the SKA regional centres for the astronomers to access and work on. That's astonishing, Greg, and it's starting to... I'm starting to realise that what we see in those beautiful radio astronomy pictures that astrophysicists produce, there's so much work and so much technology and so much energy and so many talented people beavering away in the background to make all that happen. I never realised how immense that back end of the MWA is. So thank you very much, Greg. But Let's now bring our listeners up to date with some of the finer points of your current work. So could you tell us some details of a particular problem that you're working on now that's driving you crazy or is astonishingly beautiful and exciting? Or perhaps it could be all of those things. What's going on, Greg? <laughs> yeah, so... So I lead a team of, of five. So I've got four software developers working with me and an ex-astronomer who has turned software developer. And we do a whole range of things, as you sort of mentioned before, everything from system administration of servers and networks all the way to programming, um, supporting software, web development, managing data, all of these things. So there's a lot of stuff going on and I think the thing that drives me crazy is that I wish I had time, more time for everything because there's a lot of things that we, we are dealing with. But I think probably some of the most exciting things that we're doing at the moment is we're assisting with the SETI pipeline for MWA. So that's actually a, a project initiated by a much larger project called Breakthrough Listen. So Breakthrough Listen is a worldwide program funded by Yuri Milner yep. to tap into the world's observatories and see if we can find any evidence of techno signatures from advanced civilizations. Yep. And so working on that project, I think I really love doing that because you just never know what you're going to find. And it's also a challenge from the IT side because you've got to process a lot of data in a very specific way and for the most part in real time in order to keep up with the data deluge coming out of the telescope. So that to me is exciting and cool. Another thing that we're working on as well is that currently our web portal to download data, so the MWA ASVO, does a really good job of downloading or providing the raw data to users and pre-processed data, but we don't have any pretty pictures. So many other astronomical observatories have data portals where you can download beautiful pictures yep. so for us that's all done by the scientists usually in their own systems and so as a data portal we don't have access to that what we want to build is an imaging processing step that users can optionally use to get a pretty picture from the data that they're processing and in some ways that can be a really good diagnostic tool because if the picture looks 
correct, then they know that they can spend the many hundreds or thousands of computer hours to process the data properly. So I'm selling it as a data quality tool, but really it's because I love the fact that we can make pictures out of radio astronomy images. Yeah. And I think probably the other thing that's exciting is is that project to expand the MWA to use all of the 256 tiles. It's going to generate four times more data than we had at 128 tiles. And so that's a data challenge in itself, just to be able to keep up with that data rate and make sure that all of our systems can handle that deluge of data. Fantastic. Okay. But how do you manage both the excitement and the expectations and the deadlines, obviously, that you've got to navigate on a project such as CMWA. And I know it's not going to evolve into the SKA low, that will be separate, but how do you manage both the excitement and the expectations that are on you to get those milestones met, Greg? Yeah, well, I guess the first thing I would say is that I love my job. So... Although there can be some time pressure sometimes and and maybe a, a feeling of having a, a big load of work, I rarely feel stressed as such. And part of that reason as well is because I know that, that what I'm doing and what my team is doing is effectively trying to make the lives of our researchers easier and let them make these discoveries and find out cool things about the universe. And so that's a really big motivator for all of us. I think another thing that helps is the fact that the work that my team does specifically, we're, we're a small team, but we've actually got a whole bunch of people that help us in numerable ways. So for example, the Pawsey Center, as I mentioned, without them hosting the data, we wouldn't have an archive. And also the supercomputers as well for the scientists to process the data on. Arnett transports the data. Kurt and IT help us a lot. So we have a lot of our servers, our web servers and databases and things are hosted in Amazon web services. And Kurt and IT help us manage those. And of course, we've got this massive collaboration of, I think the number is about 270 members at the moment of the MWA collaboration, who all have various skills in various things that they're not just astronomers. All of them have talents in computing, programming, and, and all sorts of things which help us. And we also have a really great management team that help take a lot of the admin off us so that we can get on with the job yeah. uh, and do the technical things that we're asked to do. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm beginning to see what a huge enterprise the MWA is. Okay. Look, back to you as a person, Greg, we've talked about your roles, your responsibilities, about the nature of that beautiful science instrument, the MWA. I saw that you've got an interest also in astrophotography, and we're lucky to have such dark skies way out there in Wadjuri Yamaji country and right here near Wangaratta. I think we're both on Yorta Yorta and Pangarang country. How's the astrophotography going? You're tuned to VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. And you're listening to an interview between Brendan O'Brien and uh, Greg Sleep, a data and analyst in uh, computer software. This is VK3 EKH. It's going great. I love it. I haven't had much time recently, so I'm the proud father of a 15-month-old baby girl, Harriet. Lovely name. And yep. she keeps us very busy at the moment. So we've also had very cloudy skies here recently too. So I haven't had a chance to grab the scope out for a while, but I currently have uh, an 8-inch schmidt Cassegrain telescope and a 73-millimeter refractor. And those two basically work in concert to allow me to to get nice wide field images so nebulae for example and the eight inch schmidt cassegrain telescope is really good for planetary stuff jupiter saturn mars 
the moon and also for the smaller targets like galaxies. And I've got a mono camera with a filter wheel so that I can do red, green and blue and, and a couple of other filters as well that are really good for nebulae. So that's your hydrogen alpha, sulfur two and oxygen three. And so with those last three filters, you can actually make what's called the Hubble palette images. So it's very similar to what Hubble uses. And if you look at the pillars of creation, the Eagle Nebula pictures of Hubble, they're often done in the Hubble palette as well. So I'm able to recreate some of those. Nowhere near as good as the Hubble though, but, <laughs> but at least I've got the same colors for the targets. So yeah, so I'm really loving it. And being out here in Yorta Yorta and Pangarang country, the skies are nice and dark compared to when I was living in Perth, where I was basically in the middle of suburbia and all of the light pollution. So it's really beautiful being out here, although it is a bit colder than Perth, I've got to admit. <laughs> Fantastic, Greg. And I'm sure you will get back to astrophotography once Harriet's a little older, but in the meantime, I'm sure you're having a wonderful time with your very young child. Thank you so much. Now, we're almost running out of time, Greg. The mic is all yours, and you've got the opportunity to give us your favourite rant or rave about one of the challenges that we face in science and engineering or in your own field of data management or perhaps our human quest for new knowledge. The microphone's all yours, Greg. Thanks. Since I've got a soapbox, I think this is my biggest bugbear at the moment, or biggest worry actually, is just the fact that at the moment, we all seem to be living in a world where information is in a bubble or in our own bubbles of information, where there don't seem to be clear facts or at least facts that everyone agrees on. And I think the internet has contributed quite a bit to that. But I think the internet has also contributed a lot of good to the world. But I think at the moment, as humans, we're not really doing a good job at handling this technological marvel that we've created and being able to maintain what we would, I guess, describe as, you know, what are the facts in the world and how do we deal with the big issues that are affecting us, for example, climate change, pandemics, you know, there's information wars all over the place and culture wars regarding these topics. And I feel like if we were able to actually all agree on the same facts, then I think the world would all probably realize that we need to act on these things before it's too late. And, you know, with my daughter, Hattie, I just think of the world that she would be growing up in and I do worry that we're not going to be tackling climate change especially before we make irreversible damage to the planet sorry to to go on a on a dark note there but that's that's currently what keeps me up at night exactly and it's something we all have to face together and we owe a duty to those young children that they have a planet to live on is there anything else we should watch out for in the near future, Greg, what are you keeping your eye on? Well, obviously the SKA. So I'm following that very closely and, and it's very exciting to see the very first steps of progress towards construction. So I would recommend anyone that's interested in, in space and astronomy to keep an eye on the SKA because that's going to only keep on progressing. Also, the Australian Space Agency started a couple of years back and are working towards increasing the capabilities of Australia for things like launching and tracking of satellites. So that's very exciting as well. Further afield, you've got the James Webb Space Telescope, which I'm pouring over the images every time they come down. And of course, the NASA Artemis project as well. So I believe that the first test launch was successful and they're going to be launching again I think it's later this year or maybe early next year. And we'll actually see a return to the moon for humanity, which is pretty exciting. And we'll also have the first person of color and the first woman setting foot on the moon as well. Cool. There's also multi-messenger astronomy, which is becoming 
bigger and bigger every day, which is basically where you combine the astronomy that you would do in your regular domain, so your, your electromagnetic spectrum. So that's radio waves, optical, ultraviolet, infrared, gamma rays, x-rays, microwave. And you combine that with gravitational wave observatories data. And in fact, just recently, there was a big announcement about the gravitational wave background. Yep. So this is the background of gravitational waves caused by supermassive black holes in the early universe. And they've been able to be detected because they've been able to use precise pulsar timing over the last 15 years to see really minute changes in the pulsar's timing. And they've made this discovery. And I think we're going to see more and more big discoveries from this combination of sort of regular astronomy with gravitational wave astronomy. So that's absolutely an exciting field to be watching. Yep. And one of the other things that I thought is pretty cool is that there are currently ideas to put a radio telescope on the far side of the moon. So because it's on the far side of the moon that never actually faces the earth, you're basically got the entire moon behind you blocking all of the radio frequency interference. So you can have an ultra sensitive telescope. And I think I would definitely put my hand up to yeah. go to one of those field trips and help build it. Fantastic Greek. Yeah, and I suppose we can imagine the moon as a very big Faraday cage. Absolutely. Putting yeah, the whole you, you earth would. in it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, we are out of time now, Greg. Thank you so much. On behalf of all of our listeners, and especially from me, it's been really fabulous. And what you've laid out in front of us is really astonishing. Thank you especially for your time. It's been a great pleasure to get to know a bit about you and your work. Maybe we'll catch up sometime for a, a coffee in Wangaratta. But for those who'd like to find out more about SKA Low, you can go to tinyurlcom forward slash SKA Low Oz, S-K-A-L-O-W-O-Z. And for the MWA, you just go to mwatelescope.org and you can follow Greg on Twitter. He puts things up there as at Paladins Meg, P-A-L-A-D-I-N-S-M-E-G. So good luck with all your projects and with all your next adventures, especially that adventure with young Harriet. Thank you, Greg. You're very welcome, Brendan. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. It's been great fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See you. Cool. Thanks a lot, Brendan. Catch you later, mate. Bye. All right. This is VK3 EK. And remember, so astrophys is free and ad free, and we always recommend that you check out Dr. Ian Musgrave's Astro blog and Southern Skywatch websites. And in two weeks' time, at the start of the month, we'll be bringing you Ian's August Sky Guide here on Astrophys. Keep looking up. Radio Wave! found that uh, uh, interview uh, of some value truly fantastic as Brendan would say <laughs> anyway um, sorry for for going on for so long uh, with this one tonight um, but um, I, I felt it was uh, better to um, uh, play perhaps the whole interview in, in its entirety just purely because it was uh, of uh, of a lot of interest there particularly I was also interested in his uh, astrophotography <clears throat> and uh, what uh, what telescopes he uses so uh, I'd be keen to see if uh, uh, if he's got any of his images available to uh, to view anyway I'm going to uh, play the latest episode of the uh, space weather woman's uh, report so this is what I should have played uh, earlier earlier on uh, my apologies for getting the tape mixed up I've got the right tape uh, plugged in now <laughs> so to speak and uh, we'll go with the, the latest uh, space weather because it was only done uh, released uh, about a day ago so it's quite current in the in the scheme of things um, this is uh, Timotha uh, Timotha Scove
we have a whopper of a solar storm on its way to Earth that's been part of a chain of solar storms that have been hitting Earth this week, plus a big radiation storm, plus ongoing big solar flares, and a whole lot of confusion in the media. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week gets crazy busy. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we have a lot of active regions that have been firing big solar flares, but all eyes have been on region 3363. This region not only has been firing big solar flares, but it also has launched quite a few solar storms. Most of them have been kind of grazing Earth or just not having a big impact, but watch it right there late on the 17th. Wham! Right there, that was a big M5.7 class flare. This actually gave us a massive radio blackout at the R2 level, and it also launched a big radiation storm that has now reached the S2 level and is continuing. As a matter of fact, it's going to continue over the next day or two before things calm down. And the reason for that is because it has also launched a big solar storm. This is one of the biggest solar storms that we've seen of this solar cycle, and even though this region is almost on the sun's west limb, from coronagraphs, it sure looks like that solar storm is going to end up hitting Earth and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, it's not the only region that's been firing. Region 3276 has also been firing. We've got a solar storm that's going to go off to the east. Doesn't look like it's going to hit Earth, but my goodness, the storms keep coming and we even have more on the sun's far side. As a matter of fact, as we take a look at Stereo's view, this is Stereo A and it's looking at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. You can take a look in the south and see region 3363 as it launches that big uh, solar flare and solar storm. You can see it takes a while for those loops to just kind of burn themselves out. This was just a, such a massive event, but believe it or not, this region is not the only one we're keeping an eye on. Because if we look to the sun's east limb in stereo's view, especially in the north, there's another region. This is old region 3354 from the last rotation. We've been watching this region on the sun's far side. As a matter of fact, as we take a look at the HMI uh, Helio uh, Seismology far side viewer, you can see that really dark region. Look how big it grows as it continues to move across the, the sun's far side. Now, this region is definitely going to be a big flare player. We got a big some big flares from it the last time we saw it in Earth view, and it's just about to rotate into view and possibly be a big storm producer as well. Now, taking a closer look at that solar storm launch, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at that solar storm launch, you can see it looks like it's mainly going west of Earth, but we've got this grazing passage right uh, hitting Earth right about midday on the 20th. So we could get a little bit of storming from this from NOAA's perspective. However, as we switch to the NASA version of Enlil and their run, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. You can see that solar storm coming off to the west of Earth once again, but not quite as as offset as it was in the NOAA model. It looks like we're actually going to get a bit more of the flank hitting Earth, which means a bigger solar storm, plus it's coming faster. From the NASA version, which is a bit more optimistic, the solar storm will be hitting us basically late on the 19th. So the difference between the optimistic version of uh, NASA saying it's going to hit late on the evening of the 18th or NOAA's version of the model saying that it's going to hit midday on the 20th. Wow, that's almost about a 24-hour window that we've got there. So we've got both an optimistic and a conservative kind of bracketing of when this storm's going to hit us. It's likely going to be about a G1, possibly a G2 level solar storm. So we could definitely get aurora down to mid-latitudes. So it's definitely worth aurora photographers for you to keep your batteries charged and keep your eye on the skies. Switching to our moon, 
We are now passing through the new moon phase, with the new moon being on the 18th, and by the 22nd, the moon will still be less than 20% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, and possibly even the Perseid meteor shower whose season is just beginning, well, now is your perfect chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that solar storm that was launched mainly west of Earth during that big M5.7 class flare back on the 17th and 18th. Now this solar storm is moving pretty quickly, but because it's a glancing blow, we're not expecting it to last for all that long. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting a major storm conditions. As a matter of fact, we have up to about a 50% chance of a severe storm, but it's only going to be over the period of the 20th, and then things are going to go back to a minor storm condition, and then settle back down. By the 22nd, we could be back to reasonably unsettled conditions. So aurora photographers at high latitudes, definitely get ready. This could be a wonderful show. And if you're really far north, you may actually have to look southward for the aurora. Now, as we take a look at mid-latitudes, well, the story is still pretty good. We are expecting uh, active conditions, well, likely going to be uh, minor storm conditions, but possibly up to about a 15% chance of a major storm. Now, NOAA's a little bit conservative on this. I would think we have a better chance to get a G2 level solar storm. That's the major storm conditions over the 20th. But things once again are going to settle down quite quickly. By the 21st, things could be back to active conditions and then back to unsettled conditions after that. But it is a big enough storm for aurora photographers, even at mid latitudes. Get ready and be prepared because on the 20th, it could be a great show if that magnetic field orientation of the storm is aligned the proper way. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, believe it or not, with all of the active regions in Earth view, including region 3363, we are seeing some of the highest solar flux numbers we've had all cycle. We're sitting well above the 200s right now, and this trend is going to continue, and this means great radio propagation on Earth's dayside. However, with all this activity also comes a moderate noise on the bands. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 55% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and even a 20% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout over the next few days. This is until region 3363 rotates to the sun's far side. But even after that, we have that new region that's going to rotate into Earth view, and that could keep those, not all of these numbers, elevated over this next week as well. So we're just going to have to deal with the radio blackouts and amateur radio operators and GPS users be sure to stay vigilant on the Earth's day side and near dawn and dusk. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are dealing with the polar cap absorption event right now due to the ongoing radiation storm that's launched on the 18th by that big solar flare. Now, originally this radiation storm peaked at an S2 level, but we've managed to kind of come under those levels. We're now at an S1 level. In fact, we're sitting right now at the D2 minor range for you aviators, which again is the S1 level, and these conditions are going to continue over the next couple days until that solar storm passes over Earth. In fact, right on the 20th, we may actually peak back up at the S2 level for a short bit before things begin to calm back down. And by the 21st, NOAA's giving us about a 50% chance that we're still going to be above that S1 level, but things will calm down. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and high-risk passengers, definitely take this uh, into account into your flight plans. And you pilots, especially if you're flying over those polar routes, be sure to check those those ICAO uh, advisories often. And with so many solar storms being launched as of late and all these glancing blows, it's very easy to get things mixed up when it comes to forecasts, especially forecasts that are having to change quite often. And when you add on top of that long-range solar wind forecasts into the mix, no wonder so many people have gotten confused as of late. But here is a nice treat of a former student of mine and now friend and colleague to help set the record straight. Hello, my name is Vincent Ledvina. I'm a space physics PhD grad student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, making a guest appearance today to talk to you about the solar storm uh, that did not, but kind of did, um, arrive last week that did not, in fact, cause aurora seen in 17 U.S. states. So what happened is that 
Um, NOAA's 27-day forecast predicted a KP of 6 based on old data, and then the University of Alaska Fairbanks Geophysical Institute, which is actually where I'm a grad student at, uh, we kind of have our own, um, we kind of take that 27-day forecast and put it into like this auroral oval simulation. So that oval highlighted 17 U.S. states, which is why you saw 17, the number 17 in all these forecasts. And unfortunately, what happened is the NOAA 27-day forecast, anything after three days or even five days is pretty unreliable. And these 27-day forecasts will take what are called coronal holes. They'll take coronal holes that they saw last month, and they assume that they'll be seen the next month after because these coronal holes last for a long time on the sun. So NOAA said, okay, well, we had a KP6 at this last coronal hole. We, we should probably see a KP6 the next time around. Well, next time around, that coronal hole closed up which means that that KP6, NOAA said, nope, we're done. We're not going to have a KP6 anymore. They invalidated their forecast. Um, but the UAFGI's forecast still stayed up. So what really ended up happening was that the news sources weren't using the NOAA official forecast as it was being updated. That was a big issue and created a lot of hype around this Aurora event that was not going to happen. Well, it was funny because I'm an Aurora chaser and I do some you know outreach online and I was telling people hey this isn't going to happen but then all of a sudden the CME launched off the sun and I was like well I'm going to look like a fool now and all the news stations are going to look like they're the ones you know getting it right. Ended up that the CME did hit but it was pretty weak and there was Aurora that was seen I think as far south as like Washington um, even central Idaho I know some of my friends saw it in North Dakota and Minnesota so there was Aurora but it just wasn't the KP6 that we were all expecting. And it was for a different reason than what was reported originally. So it was a whole chain of miscommunications. And it just goes to show you that you really have to get your sources from the right places. Thanks for my little cameo, <laughs> Dr. Scove. Appreciate it. So the space weather this week has definitely gotten exciting. We have a big solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow, possibly late on the 19th and into the 20th, and possibly the 21st before things calm down. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could definitely get a show. And even Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, you have a fighting chance to get a decent show, but it could be short-lived, so you're going to have to pay very close attention. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you're dealing with some a lot of radio blackouts on Earth's day side, and sorry, that's just going to be the way things are for the next week, possibly two weeks before things calm down, especially with the new region rotating into Earth view here over the next couple days. Luckily, though, region 3363 we're saying goodbye to, so in a few days that won't be an issue anymore. But then you also have to deal with uh, the big solar storm hitting Earth on the night side. So if you're on the day side of Earth and you get these radio blackouts, go to higher frequencies. If you're on the night side when the solar storm hits, go to lower frequencies, and hopefully you can ride this thing out. And now GP GPS users, well, things aren't looking all that great for you. Both the day side and the night side are going to be impacted here over the next couple days, so you're just going to need to stay vigilant, especially near dawn and dusk or anywhere near Aurora. And if you happen to be a drone pilot, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamma the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Timothy, for the uh, current updated uh, version of the uh, current version of the uh, space weather and the uh, uh, explanation there from the uh, the young fella as well. That was all rather interesting. I've uh, while while that uh, interview has been going on and the the space weather, I've been going around looking at various SDRs uh, around the place. Uh, and I'm currently listening to myself uh, coming in on the, uh, an SDR in Perth. Um, I've been averaging about uh, S8 to S9 on this uh, SDR, and it's uh, it's actually been quite a good signal coming into uh, into Perth. So that's me there coming back on the mobile phone, and uh, I'll hold it up to the camera. So you, that's the uh, the SDR that I've tuned into the Kiwi SDR. Uh, yeah, over there in Perth. So uh, all very good signals coming in across the, the country. Oh, it's most tuning. 
Um, <laughs> but I've also checked uh, around. There's a, an SDR up in Brisbane, and there's several um, in New South Wales. There's a there's a few over in uh, New Zealand. Um, uh, there's a one about uh, halfway that was getting a very very good signal from me, uh, and uh, I even went across to uh, South Africa, but uh, nothing being heard there. <laughs> There's a little bit of over horizon radar uh, going on too, which is um, uh, affecting uh, reception in certain places. But uh, uh, the majority of Australia, I'm covering very well tonight. So uh, I hope there's a lot of listeners out there. Now I don't, uh, I don't blame if there's anybody that's decided to uh, go to bed and and um, turn off the radio. So that's all, uh, all forgiven. I understand that's been a, an exceptionally long broadcast tonight. And why? Because I can. <laughs> Um, so I'll uh, I thank everybody that's come up on the uh, the chat window, uh, Bill VK3KHT, David VK3KDM, Cassie Obia, and uh, Martin VK7JAH. There's an SDR down there in, in Tasmania where the signal is coming through loud and clear. Uh, Kim VK5FUSE over in Adelaide. There he's uh, he was listening as well. And uh, that's about it. Not a whole lot of people on the chat window tonight. Um, quite a few people that uh, would normally sh- uh, show up are uh, not there. And uh, in the email side of it, uh, we have uh, uh, Andrew, VK3KIS, who's uh, reported in. Uh, we also have John, uh, VK2EMF. G'day, John. Thank you for listening. Uh, Steve, VK3 Hotel Kilo. He was uh, listening from his bedside. <laughs> and uh, a, a couple of other new listeners there, uh, Gavin and Chris. Uh, do we have a call sign there? I uh, can't see a call sign for Gavin and uh, for Chris. Um there might be a call sign there, but uh, anyway, thanks Chris and uh, and Gavin for uh, sending emails as well to uh, listening in. Much appreciated. All right, so uh, like I say, um, uh, Brendan O'Brien's uh, has got a fairly substantial website. Uh, it's called astrophys.com, astrophys.com, and that's fizz with a ph. <laughs> astrophys.com and he's got uh, 175 podcasts that he's uh, re- recorded over the last couple of years or so and um, uh, they are w- worth listening to uh, so uh, that uh, that particular one with Greg Sleep tonight was particularly uh, particularly good so it's uh, the reason why I ran it anyway on that uh, note uh, I shall take a quick listen on 3541 uh, just in case there is anybody still around um, but I, I don't blame you if, uh, if you want to take off right now, so that's fine by me because my eyes are popping out of my head anyway. This is VK3EKH listening on 3541 um, for any stations wishing to uh, to tune in. Alison, talk, say something. All right, uh, VK7JH, VK3UZI, I think it was, Uniform Zulu India. I'm not sure about that. And uh, I think it was a very exceptionally weak station. I couldn't really copy you. Um, anyway, uh, I'll take one more listen, VK3EKH. Okay, that's you, Greg, is it? Right, I, that, yeah, wait, fair enough. All right, um, Martin VK seven JAH VK three EKH. Go ahead, mate. Ah, oh, thanks, Martin. Good on you. VK7JH, VK3EKH. Um, all right, I'm trying to uh, run a little bit of audio over um, uh, over the YouTube channel too uh, to be picked up, but um, 
I don't know why it's all coming through. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, I won't worry about that right now. Um, yeah, well, like like I said, once again, it was all very uh, uh, very interesting interview. And um, uh, um, Brendan provides a transcript uh, of the interviews as well, which you can see. Um, why can't I hear myself? It's probably because I've got that there. Oh, now I know why. I had the um, that's it. I had the headphones plugged into the radio, so that was killing the audio. That would explain it. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm working out things as I go here. Um, thanks, Martin, and uh, no doubt you were getting a good signal from me too. So not a bad signal from yourself, actually. Um, Fifteen to twenty when I glanced at the meter. So uh, good, but I can hear that. Um, I can hear the over horizon radar. It's uh, it's just a bit of a pain in the background. Um, okay, now, next station, I'm not 100% sure on the call sign, VK3UZI, I think it was, VK3EKH, go ahead, mate. Yeah, VK3, Uniform Zulu, India, I just, um, thanks for the broadcast, I've only just popped in on the last, then you caught the last bit of it, um, next time I'll see if I can listen, come in a bit earlier and have a listen there, over. Yeah, not a problem. Um, we broadcast uh, every Friday at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, we kick off at uh, 10 and uh, it's it's on behalf of the uh, Astronomical Society of Victoria, the ASV, and uh, we've been broadcasting since 1988. Uh, so uh, we're very, very tired. I can't wait to uh, uh, to uh, put my feet up and rest. Um, it's a long, many years. <laughs> no, every Friday night, 10 o'clock, uh, since 1988, and uh, I've been actually, I have I took over the microphone about 12 years ago. Um, it, more information can be found on qrz.com. Uh, just type in vk3ekh um, in qrz.com and uh, you'll, you'll find more information there. Uh, what was your name, by the way? Uh, okay, the name is David this way. Um, I used to listen to you many years ago, um, or, the, or the broadcast many years ago, and I've had a bit of... Uh, a break away from the radio and uh, just got set up in a new QDH there so yes hopefully we'll come in a bit earlier next time over yeah not a problem David um, yeah thanks very much for uh, for uh, checking in and um, uh, really good to hear you and see that uh, uh, yeah well <laughs> like I said we've been been doing this uh, for a while um, in fact in, in about four weeks time I'll take a Friday off uh, because of the uh, where we're, we're um, uh, um, the ATV what we refer to as the ATV QSO party is uh, is happening and that ties up the ATV Melbourne ATV repeater so um, I'll, I'll be involved with all that too so that'll be a, a Friday off <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, like I say, we'll uh, we'll have a few more Fridays before then. Anyway, thanks, David. Really uh, good to hear you, and uh, thanks for calling in as well. Um, usually, the broadcasts go for an hour um, or so, but uh, tonight was an exceptional one. I'm, so I'm glad to see that Greg's still hanging in. VK3 WAY VK3 EKH T Greg. We've been up here at the Warrnambool Medshed uh, Group uh, uh, for, uh, oh, well, about uh, 7.30 uh, this evening. And uh, yeah, we stayed on, mate. Drink plenty of coffee and uh, keep it a wide awake and uh, all that sort of stuff. So uh, good evening to the ones that have checked in there, mate. It's all good. So... Uh, one hold with your clip, been a good uh, broadcast, as I said, and, uh, okay, Saturday morning. Thanks for running the net. VK3, uh, EKH, VK3WAY, 73 there, Clint, and uh, cheers to all. I'll be back again there uh, next Friday evening. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Craig. Uh, VK3WAY, VK3, EKH, very good. Thank you very much, Lee. I just had a quick listen to the uh, SDR over in Perth, and you, you're making it into um, in, into uh, into the uh, SDR over in uh, in Perth. So uh, <laughs> it's good, definitely good signals uh, across um, Australia at the moment. 
Thanks, Greg. Thanks very much, dear sir. Have a safe and nice weekend. Stay warm and uh, we'll see you next Friday for sure. Are there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3 EKH listening. Oh, I'm not sure there's another station there. It's very, very weak. Uh, try again. Yeah, a little bit hard uh, over the um, uh, the over horizon radar that's going on with all this military action that's about to uh, start occurring around the place. I suspect the uh, over the horizon radar is getting uh, well and truly used. <laughs> anyway, all right. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening in, um, and um, uh, we'll be back next Friday at ten o'clock. I, I promise to have a, a shorter. A shorter broadcast with the usual news. Uh, if Tamifa has any new solar reports, I'll definitely run that um, and make sure that it's the proper one. Uh, and uh, we'll go with that. Anyway, all right. Take care, everybody. Look after yourselves. And we'll see you all next Friday. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Information on the ASV can be found at the website at www.asv.org.au. That's www.asv.org.au. This is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone, concluding transmissions for tonight on 3541. There wasn't any uh, 160 metre transmission to. Uh, Chris uh, said that he wasn't hearing anything on 160. We're working on that. <laughs> um, we'll uh, return to 160 simulcast uh, in the near future. I'll certainly let you know when uh, we're doing our transmissions on 160. This is VK3 EKH, clear and uh, concluding transmissions tonight. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, signals in the noise. <laughs> very, very hard to um, to hear if there was a weak station there or not. Anyway, to those uh, watching YouTube, I'm glad the um, uh, YouTube held in there. Um, it hasn't fallen over, or well, the internet hasn't fallen over. So, uh, very good. Thanks for, for all the viewers out there in TV land. And... Um, uh, Definitely one for the for the uh, out of the no oh, whatever I'm tired I'm falling asleep as I stand here sit here anyway cheers everyone take care thank you for watching and uh, don't worry about subscribing and all that sort of stuff I don't pay attention to any of that stuff but if you wish to it's up to you totally so <laughs> the amount of YouTube channels where they bother you with subscribing anyway this is VK3 EKH ASV Radio uh, signing off for tonight. It's after midnight, yes. How about that? All right, where's my color bars? There's my color bars, and uh, I shall soft. So, cheers. That's good that was getting a good signal into uh, the perfect Anyway, all right, that's it. <laughs>